Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Podcast, episode number 44, Inside the NRA with special guest Kyle Weaver. Big Buck Registry is a virtual museum of hunting stories. We preserve a piece of Americana by interviewing and recording hunters about their hunts and experiences from across the country. And who knows, maybe we'll learn a thing or two along the way that'll help us take our hunt to the next level. This is Allison Roberts Elman from Go Girl Cosmetics and Scent Elimination Products. This is Kyle Weaver with the NRA. This is Milo Hansen. This is Zach Doyle with the Rack Packer Outdoors. This is Lane Benoit, Master Tracker. You're listening to my favorite podcast on iTunes. Big Buck Buck Registries, Big Big Buck Buck Podcast. Podcast. Welcome to another episode of the Big Buck Registries, Big Buck Podcast. This is Jay Scott, and I'm here with my good friend and field correspondent from Ohio, Dusty Phillips. Dusty, how are you, man? I'm awesome. Enjoying somewhat warmer weather. Okay. And looking forward to who we have on this evening. One of the best shows we'll do. Absolutely. You know, uh, we're going to be joined tonight with Kyle Weaver from the NRA. Kyle is the executive director of general operations for the NRA, and uh, we're going to find out what all the NRA has going on. Yes. And we're going to ask some good, deep questions of Kyle, and Kyle's going to answer them for us. Absolutely. You know, it, 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 we're, we want to get into the NRA more than just the legis- legislative side of what the NRA does. We want yep. to know what else is going on with the NRA. There is, I mean, if you just talk to somebody who doesn't know about the NRA, they're basically just going to say, oh, those are those fanatic uh, gun rights people. Like and That's it, not the case. It's not the case at all. At all. It's the exact yeah, they're, opposite. They're, they're, the NRA and who's behind them is, you know, husbands, wives, families, just like me and you, yep. just like you and I, the hunters that we have listening, they're, they're no different than you. Mm-hmm. They see what you see. They, they're, they're looking at things no different. You're looking at things. Yep. And, and, and the NRA is actually branching out to get more involved with the hunters and more involved with the family members. And that, that's yes. what we want you to see from, from this is that NRA is not just for Second Amendment. They're also for your family. They're for your moms, dads, cousins, uncles, brothers, sisters, kids, wives. You know, they're for the family. Right. It is definitely a organization based around the right to own and bear arms. But there is so much more to the NRA than that. Absolutely. You know, and and that's where we want to go and talk with Kyle and dig up some of that that is often overlooked. Yes, very, very often overlooked. And it's we wanted to bring it to the forefront so that you can learn more about what the NRA is all about and the great things that they have going on currently and the things they're working on that will be out in the next 12 months. Absolutely. You know, and we encourage everyone to become an NRA member and, and take advantage of the benefits and the activities and the gun safety courses and you know, everything that the NRA offers for you as a member. It, it's phenomenal. Yes. Yes. And we will have some information about how to how to become a member during the show that Kyle will tell us about. But I've got a, a special 800 number for you at the end as well. Um, let's get Kyle on the phone. Yeah. Uh, enjoy the show. It's going to be awesome. Cool. Kyle, welcome to the Big Buck Registries Big Buck Podcast. Hey, guys. It's great to talk to you again. Well, welcome aboard. Yeah, welcome aboard. We're psyched to see you again. Of course, the first time we saw you was in the media room at the Great American Outdoor Show. And, man, what a great, great show that was. But we love that little media room in the back because we got to have some pretty intimate conversations with some very cool people. Yeah, it's kind of interesting that we we put those rooms together and everything we do pretty much just to to give you guys space to sit down and relax and do some work. But it, it kind of acts up ends up being a uh, I think a pretty good asset for a t- finding talent and you know meeting unique people to, that are involved in what we do. It's kind of a getaway for us, so it ends up being more than just a, a getaway for you guys too. Right. I'm not surprised they ended up talking to Dusty because Dusty is my <laughs> is my talker. You know, I, I send him out to go talk to people. He's, he says I'm the bloodhound. He is the bloodhound. You, know, you got to have those people to be <laughs> successful. 
You're Absolutely. right. You know, he couldn't have said it better, Jay. I think I think Kyle said something there that that'll stick with me for a while. You, you got to have those kind of people. You know, I'm very fortunate to be able to to have a conversation with pretty much anybody that walks in front of me, and I like to keep it that way. I like to be a people person. I like to get to know somebody. And if it wasn't for the the press room and uh, the bloodhound, as Jay calls me, that we we <laughs> might not we might not have ran into Kyle Weaver, and, and very blessed and fortunate mm-hmm. that we did. Yep, I do believe Dusty. Yeah, it was- worked out great. I don't remember what conversation I was having there, but I saw you guys there and you overheard something we were saying and it, and it turned into a, hopefully what seems like to be a pretty good relationship. All I remember is Dusty kept talking to me. I was on the couch talking hey, to my on wife. The phone. On yeah. the That's phone. right. You were over there on the phone. That's I was right. on the phone and Dusty kept on, saying, man, Hey, you, over here. And I, kept, and I was like, one more minute, one more minute. And you're like, dude, over here, I have somebody very important that we have to talk to. And, and finally, I, I ended up handing him your card, Kyle, and that that right there sparked right. his interest right. real quickly. <laughs> I, I, uh, I ended the conversation with my wife very quickly after I got the card. Yeah, oh, said, no, I'm, I'm never more important than anybody's <laughs> wife, so don't yeah, do well, that. I know. Yeah, we, we agree to that, but it was somebody that I wanted the Jay to, you know, I know you was busy there. And, uh, you know, you you had your wife with you and uh, very nice. You, your wife's great woman and, and Seemed to be real personable and, and enjoy talking with her also. But, uh, you know, Jay, he knew when I brought the card over and said, hey, you you, you got to come over here and, and get in this conversation with me that, you know, we, we was talking to somebody that's uh, higher up in the NRA and, and we need to talk with you. Yep. And actually, on the way down there, we were, we were, Dusty was driving in from Ohio and I was driving down from New Hampshire and we had been calling each other along the way with ideas. And one of the people that I said we really need to talk to is the person that is behind the whole organization of the Great American Outdoor Show. And lo and behold, there you are in front of us. It was great. It, it worked out. Yeah. You know, it, uh, that whole thing with the Great American kind of was an interesting deal that, that, I always believe in luck. I've been been uh, someone who's been lucky a lot, but in my role at NRA, I'm the executive director of general operations. So, uh, you know, uh, I run, I oversee basically everything except the legislative stuff that Chris runs and, and some of our high end donor stuff that Wayne does, but everything else pretty much falls in my plate. And, and, uh, we, we had been doing a little small outdoor show ourselves, trying to figure out a way to get out and reach really hunters and shooters and outdoorsmen a little better than just the political message. Right. And, you know, when this whole outdoor thing went down uh, up there, with the, what used to be the old Eastern Outdoor Show, um, what it really showed is how when you, if you pin outdoorsmen of any type, I don't care if it's camping, hunting, backpacking, fishing, uh, archery, black powder, it doesn't matter. It shows how they join together. And that's exactly what happened up there with that show. And when when uh, they, they took the position they did on not displaying modern you know, sporting arms, which everyone wants to call an assault weapon, which is no more than just a semi-auto rifle. Um, first people that backed out was, was the boat guy, you know? Right. And once he went and he started taking his position, then the archery guys went and it went on down the line. You know, long story short is before it was, it didn't take too long, the show was canceled. Right. And when that happened, I, I went to Wayne. Wayne's my, Wayne LaPierre's my direct, uh, my direct boss I went to Wayne. I said, you know, here's an opportunity. And, and it's not, it's nothing about making money. This is a, this is a great thing for NRA. It's a great thing for us to do for hunters and outdoorsmen. This, this show has a 50 plus year history. We are the right people to save this show and keep it right where it is and make it better than it ever was. And actually Wayne kind of laughed at me and said, well, if you think you can do it, do it. And he didn't think, <laughs> I, think I could pull it off. Gotcha. And cause you know, we were coming out of the Sandy Hook, you know, tragedy and all this stuff. And right. it never really crossed my mind because for Harrisburg, this was a tragedy. You know, for the city of Harrisburg, this is an eighty million dollar loss for that area. And we went up there, and started working with those guys, and and there again got lucky enough that they saw the same thing we saw that we were the right group. And uh, we started out about four four or five months behind the timeline we should have been on, but we pulled it off. And you know, you guys were there, and you heard the feedback from everybody that uh, in the history of the show, it was the greatest show it ever was. But that was more, I think, because my point of view of taking that show over, we, we went in with a couple aspects that we wanted to change about it. And first and foremost was uh, bring the prices down a little bit. You know, not gouge everybody for every dollar and every penny you could to come into the show. Right. And that goes for the vendors that were uh, displaying there. The second thing was clean the show up a little bit and get everybody in there, be someone who's related to the outdoors. So bring that quality of that show up. And, uh, and, and, and bring some of the major manufacturers in that had never been there and those type of things. And then the last thing was to, to bring more activities to the town. And you saw that with, we brought an NRA country and pulled off a concert. And, uh, we, we did some fu- foundation fundraising banquets throughout the, the facility. 
and we did a lot of evening events at some of the hotels and expanded that. And yeah. lucky enough, I was up there two weeks ago and received an award from the city uh, for our show, and um, oh, wow. they, they cranked out some numbers. And I believe, if I remember right, we our show pushed hotel nights 30% more than they ever been, um, and we pushed... Uh, the other the other revenue things that they get ticket sales uh, parking things like that that the st- city and state gets was pushed like another thirty five percent and attendance ended up being over thirty percent larger than it ever was so all in all it was just a a tremendous show but the real thing for us is I think you had two hundred thousand plus outdoorsmen and women and children come through there that start to see an array for a little more than just the political arm we are definitely it was a super classy show and it had a, a very family feel to it. And I, it couldn't be ignored. I felt comfortable, um, and I'm not usually comfortable in a crowd. But and you, <laughs> you're talking about hundreds of thousands of people, and I, I thought it was the the best show I had ever been to anywhere in the country. Oh, hands down. You know, my hands- favorite thing is to watch the whole families. You know, the father, the mother, the little girl, the little boy. They all walk in. They all got all their camo on. That was the coolest thing. Right. right. <laughs> Where do you go to shows? And you say, we're going to the outdoor show, everybody get dressed. Right. And everybody goes and puts your camo on. <laughs> That's awesome. It was fantastic. Tell, tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, something that big, Kyle. It, it, it's often thought that it would take you 100, 150 people to put a show like that on. And, and I know different that that's not the case. Tell us how many people on your committee for the Harrisburg show that put that show together for the for the NRA in Harrisburg. Yeah, you know, we, we have a division called Shows and Exhibits that has a staff, full-time staff of around – uh, 12, 13 people that work on shows. And we have three full-time guys that, that live in Harrisburg and that's it. <laughs> and yeah, that, that, there, wow. it's volunteers and a mix, you know, we got a mix of a lot of other staff who mix in and run little parts, but full-time people, you're looking really full-time about five people working on the show full-time. Yeah. They're walking into that show. I, I felt like there was 10,000 people put that together and, and just took it to a level like no other. I mean, I, I'd have thought you'd had a professional organization come in there and set that show up, and which which you did, but it wasn't a large organization. It was it was in house for you guys to be able to put that together. And man, awesome, awesome job yep. to you and and your crew there. It, it was smooth. It, you did the right things to make the aisles more comfortable for everybody to walk down. I didn't feel like I was being crowded. No, nope. it was it was phenomenal. Yeah, you know, a couple of things that, that in our approach there is. We never went in with the approach to see how much money we could make. We went in the approach to see how good a show we could put on. And we had been, you know, we had been an exhibitor at that show for 20 years ourselves plus. So we, we always kind of knew how to do it and we run a lot of shows. But the two other things that are big there, one is NRA has the greatest volunteers that exist in the world in any organization. And so we have tons of volunteers who come up and, and volunteer to help run stuff and, and manage a lot of the parts of the show. And we've got a great partner in Harrisburg now, you know, and that was the other big thing we really worked on. The local police department with security and parking and, and, uh, you know, running the show hall itself and trusting us that we, we knew what we were doing because there was a lot of fears. And I think you guys were there the whole time. So you saw the two Saturdays where you kind of got gridlock and we had to have functions and move people around. But, um, that, that was handled very well, by the way. Yeah. yeah you know, that, our yeah. security guys, they know what they're doing. And in the end, I'll tell you, I mean, I've been in array 19, over 19 years now. And there's there's not a better place to work for one, and there's not a more dedicated staff to their job and the cause of what we do than, than the staff we have. And we appreciate you guys seeing that and, and and all the feedback we got from all the attendees. Gotcha, uh, Kyle. I, when I got back from the Great American Outdoor Show, one of the things I did is I put your card on my mixer board in my podcast room, and it's been there. And I I look at it every single time I do a show. So I've always got NRA kind of in the back of my head. Um, I got to ask you though, on a personal level, what does the R stand for? Exactly, rifle. <laughs> rifle, rifle, Kyle Weaver. Excellent. I mean, no, I'm, I'm just kidding with you. It stands for Robert. <laughs> I like rifle better. I think that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's cool. <laughs> it would be a better story, yeah. right? <laughs> it would be. Yeah. I think you should change your first name to rifle. I think that's fantastic. Rifle, right? Yeah. Hey, I, I no, my, uh, my, you know, I'm one of those guys. My, my mom did that to me and always called me by my middle name and at work. Yep. The reason I started doing that was, uh, one time we had a, some kind of function and, um, it was like an award ceremony or something and years of service. I don't know what it was, but, the guy that was doing it called my name, and he said he called Bobby Weaver. 
thinking Robert Short Bobby. Sure. I never responded. I left. I, I just thought, well, I guess I'm not getting an award. I never even responded to the word. <laughs> so I had to start throwing in so people would actually know who I was. That's fantastic. <laughs> I, I was sitting here, I was sitting here, and I, I actually got your card on a window ledge right here in my podcast studio. And I was like, man, that's the coolest card ever. If that stands for a rifle, Kyle Weaver. <laughs> <laughs> That is fantastic. The other thing I have sitting next to to the card is my uh, membership that I renewed at the Great American Outdoor Show for the NRA. Uh, the envelope awesome. sits there as well, so always, always there, ready to go. You know, uh, we did uh, we did over two hundred and seventy thousand dollars worth of memberships up there, which wow. that's a tremendous number for us in a show like that, especially in a show where you got a very high percentage of members already. Right. So it, it was just you know, yeah, that's it neat. wasn't. It was, we had a wrap-up meeting, and, and I was telling Wayne in a meeting, I said, you know, very seldom do you ever do something, especially the first time, and look back and say, I wouldn't change a thing. Right. And that's kind of how we came right. out of there. That is so true. And I you wouldn't know, change a thing just from I, my, my experience from my side. I, I was a little skeptical going in. I'm going to admit to this. And I was thinking that walking in the door to the Great American Outdoor Show, show in Harrisburg, I was, I was going to run into you. Hey, get an NRA membership. Hey, let's get a membership. You know, Kyle, you 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 guys did awesome with that. Nobody was ever pressured into getting an NRA membership. That 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 was unique. The NRA was not even in your way when you walked in the door, and I, I like that. Yeah, and if you look at it, NRA is not even the title of the show. Right, it's called the Great, Great American, American Outdoor, Outdoor Show. show. Fantastic. You know, it's not the NRA's Great American Outdoor Show. It's actually right. Great American Outdoor Show brought to you by the Outdoor Channel. You know, presented by the Outdoor Channel. Right. And we did do that. We, you know, there's enough there that people want to find us. We're there. We don't need to throw it in your face. And and over year, you know, we're, we expect to be here for my career that, with the NRA for sure. Is um, people will get the message. We'll, we'll get the new message, the additional message of all these programs and all these other things we do. It'll come through if they want it. But in the end, even if they don't, as long as they're in the outdoors, they're part of the family, and that's all that matters. Right. That's that's a great message. Kyle, where are you from originally? I'm from Southern Virginia. I, I grew up right on the border of Virginia and North Carolina. A uh, little, little town that ended up living in toward the end. It's actually called Virgilina. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Throw a rock in the North Carolina, basically. Nice, excellent. How did you? Know, you... When I grew up. I grew up. I lived with my grandparents most of my life, and I grew up. Uh, I tell people all the time. I grew up in the Depression because mm-hmm. that's the way we lived, and that's the way they raised me. Right. And. But all, you know, we hunted, we fished, we camped, we lived in the outdoors. And, uh, my grandfather was my hero and taught me everything I know about being a man and, and the outdoors and how important it is. And, you know, that, that's what we did. It was just, it, and one of the things I preach what we do, that's the lifestyle. That's the culture. And that's what it is. It's a lifestyle that I love and treasure and I want to pass down and keep, you know, keep alive for cultures, for generations to come. And, that's what drew me in, into you know staying at the NRA as long as I have. Gotcha. How did you become, or how did you get involved in the NRA in the first place? You know, I mentioned being lucky. It, it, that's really what it is. You know, I when I finished in college, I was a I played baseball in college, a pretty good athlete, and made the decision just to kind of end that and not try the pro route, and and uh, moved up here to Northern Virginia because where we live down here, it's kind of the, the best place to work and. I worked in the banking industry for a little while, and, and I really missed being part of a team. It, it really bothered me. And honestly, one day, I was looking in the paper, because that's what you did back then, and I saw an ad for the National Rifle Association for a job, and I went, hmm. you can work there? <laughs> it, it, it just never clicked me that you can, work, you can get a job there. I don't think I really even knew the NRA was in northern, you know, in this area. I didn't really comprehend all that. As right. a kid, you know, we were members here and there, and had, but didn't sure. put it all together. Applied for a job in the financial area and uh, went in and got lucky enough to be hired. And, you know, that, that family and that home and that team environment was, it drew me right in along with all the other great stuff we do. Gotcha. And did you work your way up through the ranks to become the executive director? I did. You know, I, I started as a financial coordinator, which is basically as entry level as it gets. And always being a very competitive, you know, kind of driving person, I, I worked hard and you know, I, I was, again, lucky enough, I started out in the greatest program in the history of, of NRA, which is Friends of NRA, and that's our fundraising banquet arm right. that, uh, you know, raises money and we grant all that money back out for the shooting sports. Um, I started there in, in, in the infancy of that program and basically worked with a great team and built it to a, you know, we raised $63 million last year for the shooting sports out of that program with over 1,100 banquets. And 
just my success there, uh, got to have a, a relationship with Wayne and, and um, built a trust and got lucky enough that after 17 years down there, Wayne uh, appointed me to uh, executive director of GO. And, um, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm a lucky guy. <laughs> That's That sounds like luck, but also a good skill set. You don't just... Uh get to where you are pure by luck. I mean, you definitely have some skills and that's great. Well, the one thing I, my grandfather made me do is work hard. I, I might not be the brightest guy in the world, but I always was taught I, I can work, I can work along with anybody as hard as anybody else wants to work. And right. that, you know, I, I tell a lot of kids who come work for me and I said, you, you can't, you can't put a value on hard work. That's right. That's uh that's something you learn from a very early age. Let's talk about the NRA outdoors some more. What is that program all about? How did they get designed? You know, we we're actually just redoing that program. The, the NRA Outdoors was a, a license, kind of a brand that we started and uh, didn't really have a, a, a home for it or, or even a structure for it. It was just a brand, you know, getting the outdoors and started selling a few things here and there, some hats and all that. And about uh, three or four years ago, we had a, a gentleman named Greg Ray, um, who a lot of people know out in the hunting industry. He's, he's worked in the hunting destination programs and stuff for a long time. He, we licensed with him and he's, he built it to a, a very successful license of working mostly with our members to book their hunting and, and outdoor and fishing destinations through us. The NRA brand is a trusted brand. Our members trust, you know, the NRA. They trust, we have a higher rating than the president by far, than Congress by far, the Senate by far, you name it. People trust the NRA. And so when we develop programs like this, we get that same trust and he did really well with it, but kind of, get you guys a, a secret out there is that we just brought that entire structure in house mm. and the NRA outdoors is actually becoming a, a division and a department of NRA with the goal of being the, the number one outreach tool to hunters for us. Um, and beyond just, you know, destinations of hunting, we're going to have long range hunting shooting schools going. Um, we're mixing in some of our hunter ed stuff with it. We're actually mixing the entire organization into this, as an outreach to outdoorsmen and stuff so they can see what's going on. So you're going to see that, that really start expanding here throughout the next 12, 16 months. Gotcha. Now, is there somebody that's in charge of the NRA outdoors as we speak? Well, kind of. Greg Ray was uh, the outside guy that was. Um, but as we brought it in-house, we, we were treating it like the rest of our brands. Um, so if you looked at Life of Duty, or friends of NRA or NRA country, you know, NRA sports, NRA outdoors is there with a little bit of a caveat that it does have some structure under. But we actually hired Greg Gray himself, the licensee that was running it. We brought him and all his staff in along with it because they'd done such a great job with it and doing it. So, uh, you know, mainly what we've done is, is we've thrown the NRA resource behind that brand now. And I'm just, I'm excited. I just wanted to, one of the things in all my years of NRA, especially the last couple of years I've focused on is how to, how do we connect with hunters? What do we do? What What is the process? And uh, this program is proving to be one that is starting to have get some traction. And so we're going to be doing a lot of neat things with it, hopefully. Excellent. We'll, we'll be staying tuned for all that stuff. That sounds very, very interesting and exactly the kind of stuff that our audience, our community over here at Chubby Tines Outdoors and Big Buck Registry want to hear. That's, that's exactly the kind of stuff we want to hear from the NRA. Now let's talk a little bit about the uh, annual meeting coming up. Yeah, we're going to be in Indianapolis starting, uh, well, it officially kicks off next Thursday, but a lot of us will go in town here now and set up. And Indy looks like it's just going to be a tremendous town for us. Uh, it's a great location, great downtown city, great support. Um, I don't know that we'll do the numbers we did in Houston last year because that broke every record we ever did. But the way things are tracking right now, we're going to be 75,000 plus people through there. And, you know, the, the activities there expand every year. Um, it really kicks off Thursday night with our, our annual NRA Foundation fundraiser. And we're looking at 2,000 people at that fundraiser with all kinds of games and stuff for sale and just a big fundraiser. It'll probably raise a half a million dollars that night for, for the shooting sports. It's awesome. And then the next morning, the exhibit hall opens up. And I, I believe this is the largest exhibit hall um, in the history of the show. And we're looking at, uh, I forgot how many, what the number is, but I believe it's, close to 700 vendors and it really when you walk through there you feel like you're at a mini shot show and that's you know, awesome. our, our members just come to love that part so that's the real draw you know, of course is that exhibit hall but as this thing has grown we've grown into some great things friday friday afternoon is the leadership forum and that's where chris cox our, our executive director of isla legislative arm um he has a just a array of speakers that will knock your socks off 
I haven't seen all the lists yet, but, you know, historically Sarah Palin to Bobby Jindal to Newt Gingrich to you name it down the line are there. And we've got that same kind of lineup coming up. And that's a great thing for our vendors. And then, uh, I mean, for our attendees. And then Friday, Friday afternoon, uh, later Friday afternoon, there's a big fundraiser for Isla out at the Indianapolis Speedway, oh, wow. which is kind of a neat, neat structure out there. And you can actually, some of our high end VIP guys get to take a, 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 a lap around the tra- track <laughs> and <laughs> right things on. like that. And then there's a great fundraiser that night. And then later that night, we have NRA Country, and I think Joe Nichols is our concert this year. Um, and you know, now, and then we're just getting started. And then right. Saturday is the real big day. We do our members meeting with our members and kind of a mini little uh, structure that we have to do for some of our bylaw stuff. But it's a great pump up, great speakers, Wayne and Chris, and all of us down the line and presentations and so forth. And then the exhibit hall is just like what you see. That's great American. It's elbow to elbow, can't hardly move, and every gun manufacturer's there. Every bullet maker's there. Every camo guy's there. You name it. it, it, it so it, it's a great deal. And then that night, we, we, we really knock it off with our, our Saturday uh, extravaganza. We call it Celebration of American Values. And this year, we have a great lineup. Ollie North is kicking it off for us. Sarah Palin is, is, is doing some speed stuff for us. Sarah Evans is doing a concert for us, and Alabama's closing the night for us. Good God, that's so, insane. What a lineup. It's a pretty good lineup. We're expecting between ten and 12,000 people there that night. So, And then you got Sunday to finish your day, finish your time out in the exhibit hall. So it's a busy, busy week, but you know, it's, it's one of those things that if you want to know where gun owners stand in this country and what NRA members think of NRA, you, you can read what you read in the paper. You can come to Indy and right. you can see it and you'll see it's pretty much opposite of what you're going to hear on TV and read in the paper. Right. Um, and it, it's a long, hard week, but I look forward to it every year. You know, it's like seeing your family again, no matter what town we go to. And yeah. It's, it's like, uh, it's like a holiday almost. Well, you know what it is? Most people, it's their vacation. I yeah. mean, I can remember you know, my first annual meeting that I went to as a staff member, I believe it was in 98 back at Philadelphia. And it was one of the first where it really took off. And this show is twice what that, that was, maybe even more than twice. And people now, I mean, most people will show up on Wednesday and won't go home till Monday. <laughs> so it's, uh, and, you know, and if you draw a 300 mile radius around Indianapolis, we have over 500,000 members. So wow. it's, uh, a lot of people can drive in and take part of it and go home and, and it's free for all NRA members to get into. You know, we don't charge to get in the show. Oh, no kidding. And what, what's the date on that again? That's April 25th? Is that when it starts? See, yeah, I believe the 25th is the first official day that the exhibit hall opens, um, with Thursday night kind of being that kick, kickoff night with the, and then it runs through the 27th. Gotcha. 25th to the 27th. 25th, April. 27th. And that's in Indianapolis. Yeah. That is beautiful. And, it's, you know, if anybody who's ever been and, and, and uh, had a hard time, I think they'll find this city, uh, dealing with the city we're looking at, you know, there's 25-plus hotels right downtown, and uh, it makes it so much easier for the when you get crowds the size we have for people getting in and out of the city doing things. So I think it's just going to end up being a town that we definitely revisit again. It sounds like uh, you've got it all set up. If it's anything like the Great American Outdoor Show, then it's it's going to be an amazing event. Oh, it should be. Well, a fun you know, and that's kind of where we cut our teeth for the Great American Outdoor Show. The hardest thing about the NRA NRA annual meeting is we move it every year. Right. So we go into a new setup every year, whole different deal. So going to Harrisburg and getting to do the same thing over and over and over, that's easy. <laughs> right. Well, right. what's amazing is you go from Harrisburg and then get into Indy. That that's a lot going on. Yeah, and it's the same staff, the same people I talked about that did that one. They all just put on a different hat and transition right into the uh, annual meetings. And that's uh, awesome. When you know, when from February to April and to May, when June, I think they can take a day off and relax a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Give them a couple get, of days off, sure. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> At least one. At least one. Yeah, right. Let's get in a little bit what the NRA and conservation. Let's cover what the NRA's got going on out there in the field. You know, we it, it's kind of the, the best kept secret in the world, with the, in, or in, in the industry, which is a bad thing for us. But um, we have so many things that are that are toward you know conservation and hunting and, and and all that stuff. And you know, from a legislative side, we don't really talk about about it very much. But we're we're in every state all the time fighting for uh, keeping lands, keeping access to those lands. You know, trying to get uh, right to hunt into con- hunt con- state constitutions. Uh, working on on Sunday hunting that we finally got passed in Virginia. We're working on North Carolina, other places like that. So from a legislative standpoint, we're always working on stuff like that day and night. We work hard with uh, with the feds on keeping, especially the federal lands. 
We do a tremendous amount of work of keeping ranges open and keeping those going. But beyond that, uh, you know, we may not be out front on everything that people see because sometimes that's not the first place to be. A lot of times when it comes to some of the conservation and and wildlife things, it's better for us to be behind pushing, and and that's what we do. But we work with every group, you know, SCI, Ducks Unlimited, every whitetail group there is out there. Um, You know, one thing we all have in common is is keeping lands and keeping animals and conservation available. And uh, we do a lot of, of funding through grants and projects of that type. Uh, we've really worked hard the last two years to reestablish our relationships with all the state wildlife agencies. I have I have a, a position that, that I created, and that's all they do. And, and in the last two years, he's been in every state wildlife director's either in their office or met with them at a show somewhere along the way and had a conversation. So we've developed strong relationships with them. And, um, you know, most people don't know the NRA wrote Hunter Education. Is that now, right? We made a mistake many years ago, and we let other people have it. I wish we still had it. Right. But we wrote and designed that. You know, and most people don't know that. And, yeah, I didn't know that. I didn't know that either. That's awesome. And and we still have a big hand in it. You know, we work with those guys. We work with the International Hunter Education people, and we still run a, a Youth Hunter Education Challenge with kids, and and we fund all that stuff. And it's pretty endless. We do a tremendous. I don't know what the number is, but it's somewhere in several millions of dollars of just wildlife projects and and grants that we've made. One of the negatives I think sometimes we do in NRA is we try to do everything, and a lot of times the best thing we can do is promote and support our partners that are also doing it. So we're doing a lot more of that as well. Um, but we got to do, we're going to continue to do a better job too of letting people understand that, you know, uh, some of the stuff I talk about a lot here lately is I don't care if you're a hunter, uh, a shooter, a bow hunter, a fisherman, woman, child, man. There's a home for you in NRA. There's a program for you. There's there's something we have for you. And, and we support what you do. And that's something we're focusing on trying to get more out there. And that that brings the, the whole family into the picture with the NRA. And that's something I know that's overlooked very often with the NRA behind something that not only, you know, as far as legislation, but on a family note, the NRA is definitely involved with everything that has a association with family activities. And I think that's overlooked way more often than it should be with the NRA. It is, you know, what we're, what we're up against here is a cultural battle. Um, you know, the, the current administration doesn't like the culture the three of us like to live, which is I want to go outside and I want to do what I want to do. I want to hunt. I'm a law-abiding citizen. So I don't break laws. I follow game laws. I pay my taxes do everything the like, way I should. And if I want to go sit in a tree stand for eight hours all day and sleep, I should be allowed to. Right. And if I want to carry a 223 or a 308 AR, I'm not hurting anybody. That's our culture that these people don't like. Right. They're trying to take away. And, you know, NRA, that whole family, that culture, that ability to pass this down generation to generation, the ability for me or you or to own our grandfather's gun and pass that grandfather's gun down to our grandkids. We want to be able to do that. Right. And, you know, this structure we're in right now doesn't want to be able to do that. And so it, it's a cultural battle. And in the end, it doesn't matter what kind of hunter or outdoors person you are, we got to stick together in this fight to protect our culture. Um, no matter what state you live in or where you hunt or how often you do it. And it's, uh, it's important to us. And we, we understand that and we always have. And, and it is about the family and the focus. I just, yeah, you know, it, it often overlooked. That, that's something that, uh, you know, that's why we're here today talking with you that we, we need to hear that and, and our listeners need to, to understand what all the NRA is involved with, you know, obviously conservation. What, what else do you have in the workings, Kyle, that uh, may be something in the future we might see from the NRA? Well, you know what? The biggest change I think people are going to see on a, on a real broad base is that the last 20 years, uh, we have been in a, a fight. It's been about people wanting to take our guns away. And we, through the help of all of our, all gun owners out there getting involved, um, we've been, we've won. And then we're going to continue to win. We're going to continue to stand and fight and win this battle. But outside of that, it's time that we start this other additional message so people understand. You know, most people don't know 8%, 8% of our budget goes toward lobbying. Wow. So there's a lot of money left and all that money goes into programs and promotion and marketing of, of our, our, this culture and this lifestyle and protecting it. On my side, you know, we have 10 divisions. We have a law enforcement division. We have a museum. We have competitive shooting, education and training, field operations, on down the line. And all of these divisions have multiple programs that connect somewhere to just about everybody owns a gun somehow, some way. You know, we, we produce 100,000 instructors out there 
that we teach to uh, teach people how to properly and safely own a gun and hunt and shoot and carry, conceal, whatever it may be. Um, and some some of the new stuff we're focusing on, you know, one, one of the biggest things you're, that we're seeing right now with Bloomberg is this huge fight against us, and he's really focused on child safety and gun control. And the only group in the country, the only group that's doing anything for a safety program related to firearms is NRA. Everybody else talks about how bad it is and and that, you know, we need to take all the guns away, but no one's doing anything to educate a kid on what to do. Right. You know, and that's what our Eddie Eagle program does, and it's been around for over 20 years now. And, you know, we talk about it, that if you have kids, you, know, you teach your kid, stay away from a hot stove. Don't grab a hot boiling water and pull yourself. Don't touch a hot fireplace. We teach them stay away from drugs. We're teaching them about, you know, sex education. We, we That's our job as adults to teach our children this. But we want to teach them what to do if they come upon a gun. Why not? Right. So that's what we do. And what we've done with Eddie Eagle that is coming out. It's being beta tested, and most people don't know anything about this yet either. But you're going to see Eddie come out in a web, an iPad, iPhone, tablet formats now, which is how kids learn. Very interactive, very much like a Pixar-type uh, film movie type stuff where we can now reach millions more kids than what we're reaching now and make it free to anybody. That's awesome. NRA's name mm-hmm. is not on it. Anybody can go on any of the formats, Android, computer, iPhone, doesn't matter. Download Eddie Eagle and sit down and teach your kids about fire safety. Right. That's uh, that's huge. That is huge. It is. You know, and it's a it, it's a multi million dollar investment NRA is, is making into that. It's not cheap to do stuff like this. But right. there again, we're not in it. It's not about money for us. This is about the safety and this culture and, and doing what we were founded on. Yeah, you know, most people don't realize how NRA was founded. You know, after the Civil War, NRA was founded because a bunch of generals got together and said, you know what, if we were ever in a real battle, we're in trouble. And I, I don't mean to be, you know, north-south about this, but that's the way it worked out. The north didn't know how to shoot. If they didn't know how to shoot, the war would have lasted a day. Our marksmanship was terrible. Right. So they said, we got to get together and create something and teach our people how to shoot if we ever got in this situation again. And that's how the NRA was started. And, and they, they got together and called it National Rifle Association of America, and we founded it in New York. It was all about marksmanship and education and training. And that's where we started. We still are the leader today in it. Right. But we've really expanded beyond that, of course, and uh, into the culture and, and being the leader, of course, in protecting our safety and all that stuff. But we've never gotten away from our core. We are the standard in that training and safety. Right. The Southern, uh, the southern troops were uh, extremely well-trained and very good shooters. And I mean, it was only because the North was so big that they eventually, I think, had their, their that one shot at Gettysburg. And, and yeah, the, 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 I heard a guy say this saying the other day. He said, you know, the way they equated it was it took three uh, of the North to be as good as one of the South. Mm-hmm. The problem was there was five to one. <laughs> that's right. That's exactly and right. That, that's really what it was. Right. The, the Southern armies did so much damage with so few people. Yeah. Compared to the North. It, it was It's mind boggling. And there was just. And that really is what, if you go back and look at some of the history, that's what brought NRA about. That's right. what it, it came out of, out of the Civil War and that exact issue that if we ever had to protect our country, and back then, you know, militia, what militia term was of, of you know, men coming out of the farms like they did then and fought, right. we weren't prepared to have another Revolutionary War or something like that. We wouldn't be prepared. And that, right. that's where it started. Right. And like I said, the, we still do that today. We still are the leader in teaching people how to safely own a firearm right. and be a better marksman in, 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 the, in the field or, or in competition, whatever it may be. Now, knowing that the NRA was basically founded out of some generals getting together after the Civil War, what... When did the anti-activist, anti-gun activists start raising their voice about this stuff? You know, it really started in, in 1968. Okay. There was a... That makes sense. In, there in Lynn, Lyndon Johnson, there was a big move, and it was massive gun legislation passed. And um, it took us, and even Richard Nixon came in and, and even furthered it a little more with some stuff, almost getting into confiscation. And that's where the NRA really got involved and really had to get after it. And really since, you know, those 70s through the 80s, through the Reagan era and all that, we didn't hit that hard. But when we came out of the Reagan era and came into the, the Clinton era and the assault weapon bans and all that, it, it just ramped right back up. And, um, you know, that that was uh, but that was kind of, you know, the, the, the whole culture changed during the Vietnam War. The whole, everything changed in this country, and and that's where that real push against taking guns away from individuals' rights to own it started. Gotcha. Now, I've, my son and I, in some of the most precious moments I've ever had with my son, 
are shooting the BB gun in my backyard. We spent a lot of time in the backyard shooting BB guns, and for the first time ever, he shot a 20 gauge. He's only six years old, but I actually had the, the shotgun out, and we tried it for the first time. And it's it, there's a special moment between father and son when you're teaching your children how to safely use a firearm. And it works both ways. Me being a father of three three girls, it's the me same. Too. Uh, yep. <laughs> it's the same for me that it was for you, Jay. Uh, you know, mine started out with a rifle, also not quite to the twenty gauge at five, but uh, you know. Well, it's, uh, my son's pretty rugged, six year old. So that's you know that's awesome. Yeah. Yep. Now he shot it. it you know, we we do a lot of things uh, in in try to introduce kids, and and there's nothing like that lighting up of their face. Yep. when they accomplish something like that. And, you know, that's one of the greatest things I think about shooting is the dis- discipline and, and just the courteousness that comes out of, of kids, what they learn. In all my travels and talking, especially when I get around kids that shoot competitively and travel and shooting teams, everybody you talk to will always tell you that they get high school, you know, you name the athletics through these hotels, and they'll always tell you that the shooting kids that come through the most polite most disciplined, put together children they ever see, yep. and that just kind of goes right along with you know it, it needs to be taught. There's there is a discipline. You can't be goofy in this thing. This is a serious deal. A lot of accountability. Absolutely. But there's also a lot of reward in it. Yeah. And and I knew that I was on the right track because he was taking it seriously. And and I you know there, there's always this moment of of a little panic because you know the power you're putting in your six year old's hand. Yeah. Even though you're there, but it's it's it is a little unnerving. But then to see that kick went into his shoulder. And it startled him, and he felt that power. And I think that power is is a very important thing to understand because that there's a lot of a lot of power in your hands at that moment, and you'll, it'll, he'll remember that forever more. And then and he got a little like weepy, like oh that hurt a little bit more than I really wanted it to. Mm-hmm. And we we picked up, and I said, all right, let's take let's go inside. We'll shoot another day. And about 20 minutes later, he goes, Dad, let's go shoot it again. <laughs> I was like, yes, this is a win. You know, and that, that same accountability and everything that this taught them is the same thing we teach through everything. You know, being an ethical, respectable gun owner is what it's all about. What we fight for is the law-abiding gun owner. Exactly. We don't fight for criminals to own guns. We fight for them to be prosecuted, put them in jail, and, and stop that stuff that's going on there. The prosecutions are at an all-time low. But it's all about law-abiding people, and that's who we are. And we ought to be able to enjoy, you know, shooting is a number one sport in the country. If you take all the other sports together and add them up, it still doesn't equate to the number of right. people who participate in the shooting, the hunting, and outdoor sports. I, I can't imagine a world where I would not have that ability to take my son in the backyard to teach him how to shoot. It would be a, It's a crime in itself if that ever came to be, and that's why the NRA is so important. Yeah. You know, what it really comes down is living in a world where you don't even have the choice to do it. Exactly. I tell people all the time, it doesn't, if you don't want to own a gun or you don't believe in that, that's fine. I'm not, a, I'm not thinking everybody should because if you don't think you should, you shouldn't. But to take my right away to do something as a law-abiding person, that's where the problem starts. And, uh, you know, it's in our DNA. It's how this country was founded. You know, we fought for our freedom. We still fight for our freedom every day and people forget about that. Mm-hmm. But that's how we, it, it's a different culture here. We have a different DNA than a lot of other countries. And, it would, you know, it would be a shame to see something like that taken away from our kids. And you talk about yours. My oldest daughter, the first time I took her shooting, um, had a little twenty two chipmunk rifle, still have it, you know, those little yep. small ones, perfect size for kids. It was back home, and uh, my cousin was at his, out of his farm there, and he had been fishing or something. He had some old, I don't know if it was pop or probably beer on him. He was laying there, <laughs> it was old that uh, been fishing and wasn't no good anymore. And I took those cans of beer and I shook them up and put them down there for her and gave her the rifle and had them stacked for her. Pretty much she, she's going to hit one somewhere. And the first shot she hit really low, you know, was expecting recoil and all that. The second shot she hit that, and those cans exploded, went everywhere. And she was hooked. <laughs> yeah. She was absolutely awesome. hooked. <laughs> yep. Don't get no better. No, nothing like an interactive target like that. Yep. Right. Yeah, for sure, you know. And, and if it wasn't for the NRA, that, that moment might not have been possible. Yeah. Can I mean... There's places now, if you lived in certain states around here, you wouldn't be able to go out on your farm and do that. Right, exactly. That's a shame. There are places now you can't do that. And that, that's a real shame. That's that's just completely un-American. If you ask Especially me. if you want to shoot a twenty two rifle because you can't get any ammo still. Right. Yeah, the <laughs> shelves are empty. I go into every Walmart and there's nothing. It's, so, un- it's unbelievable. People ask me about that one all the time, and I just say, I, you got me. I, I don't have an answer. I don't know what's going on. Yeah. 
I don't know. Let's talk about uh, Cam and Company a little bit in the NRA news. Um, Dusty and I were down in at the Great American Outdoor Show, and we walked around the corner, and there was a, a production going on, a TV show. I'm like, what is this? And I was unaware of the Cam and Company podcast at that time. And I guess Cam is broadcast on TV and it runs a few different times during the day on other channels and the podcast on iTunes and other directories. And I was hooked. I listened to Cam and Company the whole ride home. And I had a seven-hour ride back from Harrisburg. And I listened to, I think, two of Cam's shows, the whole thing. And I was, I was like, this is pretty good. And talked about the same stuff that we were talking about back then. It was awesome. Yeah, Cam, Cam and Company's been with us for quite a while now. They're, they're really their own entity. You know, they're, they call themselves the NRA News, but they, they kind of cover the, the stuff how they want to cover it. We don't really, what do you want to say, oversee or manage them, but they, right. they're definitely on, on our side and, and, and are partnered in with us. But, um, you know, it started out, Cam and Company really started, they were on Sirius Radio. We, we had a, on the Patriot Channel and they did several years on there and, uh, you know, as, as that kind of went up and down as, as you know, uh, paid radio went up and down, um, expanded more into some of the podcast stuff. And then when we had the tragedy at, at Sandy Hook, the TV show got put together and put it on Sports Channel Live, and the ratings were just huge coming out of that of people. It was where you went to find out what was going on and, and really tracking what was what was happening with our gun rights. And uh, it just really gained a whole other level of, of, uh, of momentum. And I think now we're, if I'm no right, we're on Heart Radio, and uh, yep. we've got the pod stuff going. It's on Sports Channel every night, and everything else he's doing live, streaming on the web. And uh, I, you know, I don't even know where our listener listenership is, but it's huge. And I'm like you, I go there a lot to get caught up on what's going on because Cam is always on the front edge of what happens every day, and he gets some great, great people on the show, from high end politicians to, you know, some of the individuals that are up against certain issues that happen in their state with people coming after them or have experienced a, something where they use the gun to protect themselves, you name it. I mean, he's always there. It, it's, it's turned out to be a great resource for getting additional messages about the organization out. Yes, and it, it's it's extremely interesting to get caught up on all the, the headlines of the day that you'd like to know as a, a gun owner and the legislation that's coming up, and he does a great job covering it. Um we did speak with Cam by Facebook, and he's agreed to be on this show at some point. So we're looking forward to that down the road. Yeah, Cam's a he's a he, he is not many any better than him when it comes to covering what's going on in our industry. I totally agree. He is he is on top of it, and he he's not only talks about it on the show, but he's constantly updating his own personal Facebook page. If you're his friend, and the uh, you know NRA News is always updating it as well. It's, it's just great, great show. Um, what would you say we could do with the hunter or the family that's kind of off the grid that are firearm owners and they're not really aware that there is a fight going on out there in the legislator aspect or in politics because they're just not plugged in as much as the rest of the world. And they're, they truly are the people that will say, uh, you can have my gun if you take it from my cold, dead hands. How do you reach out to those people to get them involved and, and get become members? Is there an effort you know, there? It's, it, it's been a hard thing for us, and I think we're finally making a little traction. But I think what it comes down to is when you're seeing what's in the media and what's going on out there, the other side does a great job of selling to hunters and just everyday people, hey, we're not after your everyday hunting rifle. We're not after your, your grandpa's gun. We're not after that. We're not after that. And, and it becomes believable. But the only reason any hunter has a gun today and can still hunt with it is because of the 5 million members of the NRA. That's it. Exactly. And, you know, you, you hate to be that forward with it sometimes, but that's what it's about. They they don't want to nitpick guns. They want all guns. They don't really care. They might start at one end of it. But if, if everybody ever saw the legislation that comes through, you know, back in the assault rifle coming out of that, there was bands coming in. They wanted to go after boar size. And what they started talking about was, we want to go after 50 caliber rifles. Well, just about every shotgun has a bigger bore than a 50 caliber rifle. So if that had went through, yeah, you could have kept your 22 and your 223 maybe, but anything that had a bore the size of a 50 caliber bigger was gone. That's just about every shotgun that any hunter hunts with. So it, it, you know, it's a game of that side. And I know a lot of us are just non-political, and, and a lot of hunters don't don't like it either. But Beyond that side, NRA does a tremendous amount for hunters, and that that's our fault to a point that we haven't gotten that message clear. And I think you know, working with guys like yourself, working with all the other groups out there, we're going to do a better job of of getting people to, as a hunter, come check out the NRA 
and see that there is a home here for you. We, we do have other things beyond the American Hunter Rifle uh, Magazine and, uh, you know, and, and what we do legislative. We have a lot of programs that, uh, and, and some new stuff we're doing. We're working on a lot of different things that we want to, we're working on some new data stuff coming in for hunters, getting the best data about where to hunt, how to hunt, uh, best places to go. We've got, you know, NRA Outdoors now if you want to place, if you're looking for a great hunt with a great outfitter in a certain place, yep. we've got that stuff coming. And honestly, I'd like to hear from hunters. What would you like to see from NRA? Because I'm willing to sit here and say, whatever it is you, you want to do, I'll do everything I can to produce that for you. Um, in most cases, we probably had it and just didn't know about it. But, you know, feedback to you guys through the pod, through your, through your Facebook, wherever it may be, feed into the guys at Big Buck and let them know what, what it is you'd like to see NRA do for hunters more and we'll, we'll do our best to do it. We will definitely put that out there. And I know Dusty will put it out on Chubby Tines. Um, oh, absolutely. There's that, that's, a, if you guys need to know what, what the hunting community wants, we will pose it to our hunting community and we'll get you some answers absolutely. on that. I mean, that's, you know, sometimes you can sit and guess and do all this stuff all you want, but in the end, you know, let, let's hear it from the, as they say, straight from the horse's mouth. And, and, uh, I'm committed. One of the, the two things I'm most committed to in the next couple of years here with the NRA is, is reaching out to hunters and getting hunters to join this organization and understand that we're, we're doing more than just your hunting, saving your guns. You know, even we do stuff for bow hunters on the line. It doesn't matter. And two is women. You know, women's the fastest growing part of gun ownership and, 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 uh, even in some of the hunting and shooting disciplines. And we're going to do a much stronger job of, we've got some great programs now, but we've got more stuff coming there to, to show women as well. The NRA is a home for women as well. They, and that's awesome. And what would you think about maybe a, a NRA outdoors podcast? You have the NRA news, which covers a lot of gun stuff, but would you entertain the idea of doing a podcast just for the NRA outdoors? Absolutely. You know, it's a, probably a pretty good idea as we get that stuff in place and get it put together um, is to really start talking to people and have a have a form for, for hunters. And, and that's some of the stuff we're talking about. One of the other new things we've got coming that we haven't, we'll introduce here probably in the next uh, four to six months is, is how we how we speak to the public and the members through our web. And, and when I say that, I mean, if you went into the NRA's website right now and you went into things, it really talks to you through programs and, and through the organizational chart, as I like to say. And I want to talk, we wanted to speak to members one-on-one. -on -one. If you're a hunter, you should come into the, the webpage and come through the hunting part and see what we do have hunting. In one place, find everything NRA's got going on for hunters, for women, for military, law enforcement, capable, disabled, challenged, it doesn't matter. So instead of seeing this vast organization and start having a hard time figuring out how to get through it, this whole new format is going to speak to people individually and allow themselves to, to visit us and see what they want to see on a daily basis and not things they're not interested in. And that kind of goes along the lines you're talking about as an NRA outdoors piece that's really just strictly mainly to hunters and outdoorsmen. That that's all they want to hear. I know you're fighting for me. Keep the fight up. I don't really want to hear about it. We can do that. <laughs> right. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, you know, it, it's uh it's it's a huge organization that that's um you know, we could talk for five hours and never repeat something probably. It's I don't even know the number of programs we run and you know we have over six hundred staff. Uh, we have a field rep in place that covers multiple field reps that cover, make sure all 50 states are covered. We've got 15,000 affiliated clubs and business alliances across the country. It just goes on and on and on. It's more of, you know, us doing a better job, talking to the everyday people, the everyday gun owner, and understanding that NRA is, we are the political machine. We're always going to stand and fight and, and ensure that this culture and this rights we want stays in place. But outside of that, you know, come to the Great American Outdoor Show, come to the NRA annual meetings, Find your local NRA club, log onto the web, check out NRA Doors, book a hunt through NRA Outdoors if you're going to go on a hunt. Check it out and see what that's about, and you'll learn real fast about just everything else we have to offer. We had one thing we just offered the other day that's completely sold out in like four hours, which is a uh, Benelli pheasant hunt with some of the Team Benelli guys. Wow. And so you come out and you get to shoot with these guys, but you also get to learn stuff, try new product, and shoot a few birds in the process. Those are some of the things we're doing. Right. And one of the neatest things we have is these long-range shooting schools. And what they're about is being a better hunter. It's not about learning to shoot in a long distance. It's about learning how to be a better hunter and taking long shots and taking good ethical shots. Hmm. So that if you learn how to shoot at six and 800 yards shooting at an animal, it makes that three or 400 yard shot pretty easy. Right. And that's just something we're trying to offer to a hunter. I mean, you know, anybody's gone out with the lives in the east like we do and then you go out west and 
someone says that's only 400 yards shot and you're like only 400 yards you know i don't i've never seen anything past 100 yards in the east right and it's intimidating so you know say a hunter comes to us and he's going on wants to go on an elk hunt of a lifetime we're going to come to you in the in what, what we have in our outdoors right now and I'm, I'm building a new system and is that tell you here's all the gear we recommend and if you don't have that gear here's some discount places you can go buy it that are connected to inner outdoors you know, here's here's some of the physical fitness stuff you need to do to get in shape through NRA Freestyle and NRA Fit, which is some new stuff we have coming. And then if you're, you haven't done a lot of long, long range shooting, here's a school you can go to, learn how to be a little better long range shooter, how to shoot in the wind and do these things. And by the time you get on that hunt, make it a hunt of a lifetime. That's some of the stuff we're doing in our outdoors that I think, I hope will be something that hunters would love to have from the NRA. Oh, yeah. Uh, as a hunter, I say absolutely. You know, uh, speaking personally, that's that's completely unexpected that you're doing that and that you're doing it. It's awesome. Well, we want to kind of be that full package, you know. And uh, right. as yeah. I said early on, people trust NRA. We want to keep that trust. And, uh, you know, it's it's an intimidating t- deal Growing up, you guys probably like me, I never hunted out of the county I lived in until I started working for the NRA, you know. Right, right. And that's the way most of our members are. And they save up and save up. And they want to go on a hunt a lifetime. The thing we want to do is make sure they're with the best outfitters, getting the best bang for their buck and the best experience. And our people know hunting's not killing. Hunting's an experience. We want them to have the best experience that they can and hopefully get lucky and be blessed enough to take an animal. But if not, come out of there just loving the whole experience in the end. And I think that NRA touch to the whole deal will be just a great thing for all of us in the outdoors and, and for hunters. And, and we'd love to we'll work with you guys to, to really kick that off uh, going into the fall and, and then especially into the next season at, at the uh, Great American. Oh, yeah. That's going to be awesome. excellent. Yeah, um, that, that, takes you, that takes your NRA membership to, a, to another level. That, uh, that, that's another huge thing you got going. Have yeah, you know, that, that's kind of some of our stuff we're, that we're focusing on on my side with the membership stuff is – a lot of people see our membership as a magazine subscription. Right, right. I pay twenty, you know, any twenty five, thirty five, depending on which pack, what you buy, and I get a magazine for twelve months. But they, because they don't even understand how to take advantage of all these other assets. Right. And these are benefits of being a member. We are a member organization, and we do a lot of things for all hunters and all public. But in the end. We want to do more for our members, and we want to say, yeah, you, you have to be a member to get to this, but that's what who we are. We're a membership organization, right. and we want to provide these better tools. And one of the things I've just started working on with the industry, and if you ever go to an annual meeting, if you've never been and you go, go talk to any vendor there, and they'll tell you when they come to the annual meeting, they almost put everybody in a sales meeting again and re-up on their, on their stuff. Because the NRA people come in, they know their stuff. They know their optics. They know their guns. They're going to ask you questions you've never been asked, and they know. And most of the time, they already know the answer. They want to see if you know it. Right. And so, one of the things right. I've worked on the industry on a little bit is say, what if we put a good product testing program together through Entering Outdoors for our hunters and our shooters to give you the best unbiased feedback on your product? What a great ass and, and, and be a great asset for as a as a benefit for a member to get to those things. So, there's some of the other things we're working on that we not quite there yet, but we'll have in place hopefully in the next year or so. Right, right, and that, that comes back to the trust too. Uh, you know, being able to trust the shooters and the testers, it, it's all you know, it's all comes together with that. Yeah, and yeah, and, and get discounts for NRA members. There again, not only do members trust us, industry trusts us. So. Right. Let, allow us to to offer discounts to your to your our only members only product pro, uh, purchasing programs and and we already have that within our outdoors uh, with a lot of vendors that's already in place that we're bringing in house that um, for example if you were going on a certain um, whether it's a moose hunt or a goat hunt or something with a lot of climbing we've our guys have already tested all kinds of boots and we're not we don't have a sponsorship we just say this was the best boot and if you want to buy it. Here's how you can buy it, and we pass the discount the vendors give us right onto that member when he's buying that boot to have mm-hmm. the best thing he can to hunt. Those are things we've already got in place that we're going to expand. So hopefully those are the things we can do for hunters and that bring them more and, and CNRA is a, is a great place to, to be a member of. Absolutely. Completely agree. A couple of uh, closing questions here for you, for you, Kyle, before we let you go. Um, how's the deer hunting in Virginia? We got more deer than we know what to do with. <laughs> I'll tell you how it is in my county here in Loudoun County. I live in Loudoun County, Virginia. Is uh, archery season opens on September one yeah. and closes on March thirty first. Wow, that's a lot and we still of deer. Have a deer problem. Yeah. So there's pockets around here. The, the number of whitetail is just tremendous, and uh, we're actually in in some of these more you know suburban areas having issues to figure out how we're going to control it all. 
But when you get out into the mountains of Virginia and, and down in the, in the swamps and stuff, you can kill some big deer in Virginia. Yeah, I've done some hunting in, in and around Williamsburg, and I'm just yeah. completely blown away by the numbers of deer that I see. Uh, it's just not. And we like... have a tremendous number of hunters in the state. You know, we exactly. just, we're lucky to have a state that has what it has. You know, we have we have the coast and the and the beach. You come inland, you have a little more of the flat lands and peanut farms and things like that. Then you kind of start getting into central Virginia and wooded areas, and as you get into the west, you you got you know decently hilly areas in the Appalachians and stuff like so. You got a whole different big pieces of culture. Now, if you've seen the stuff Rocky Mountain elk's done, but we also you know all the elk are taken off down in southwest Virginia. Yes, so I've heard that. Back yes, again. and uh, it's a it's a pretty good state. The only thing we really don't have a tremendous amount of is upland hunting, and you know, we we lost a lot of the quail and things like that. But right. outside of that, it's a pretty good state to hunt in. Absolutely, and uh, you know people are. I grew up, where I grew up as a kid, you know, everybody hunted with dogs real heavy. And that was just the culture. Mm-hmm. And a lot of them still do it. And yep. It's fun and all that. But a lot more people, as lands are getting more private, it's harder to do. And you get a little more still hunting and some of that coming back. I think we're also seeing, you know, the quality of the deer increase a little more too. And, you know, that, that kind of goes hand in hand with, with, mm-hmm. with that kind of stuff because the deer... Not because the number of deer shot, we can shoot all the deer we want, but because the deer aren't run around as much and hard and stuff. But dog hunting is still popular, but without as much of it, uh, it definitely uh, helps, I think, build a little quality deer a little more. You know, like I say, I go home with my cousins. If we go deer hunting, we're running them with dogs. That's what we do. Yep, and I've done that. <laughs> and when I hunted Virginia, we actually ran dogs. And it was a totally different experience than anything I'd ever uh, had before. But I got to say, it wasn't any more successful than the hunts in Virginia we were on when we didn't have dogs. So yeah, it's it's just a different approach. And it's just a different approach. It's, uh, it's definitely uh, very family oriented. You know, for me, that's why I could, even today I have a hard time sitting in a tree stand for so long because I would I always loved being the guy that went with the dogs and ran them. You know, and right. I just enjoyed that part of it. And it's it's just it's just more of a different style. It's just fun it's just a different way of doing it and uh you know you all kind of meet together make a drive come back together and mm-hmm. have a drink of water and eat a snack and make another drive and we were poor people we could, we didn't have all these satellite collars and all that stuff that they have nowadays you know you, you did little small pieces of it together and and uh, like you said i don't know that we didn't kill any more deer than than i see anywhere else it was just a different style that uh you know, we, we support it. Right. And I think that's one of those misconceptions. If you've never run dogs before, it's no more successful than not running dogs or doing a drive with a group of your buddies, you know, a human drive instead of a deer drive with dogs. It's, it's just a different thing. It's just a different style. It is. It's, uh, and there's a lot of controversy out there on it. And, and NRA, you know, we, we kind of get drawn in and out of it quite a bit. But, uh, you know, we support all legal hunting. And ethical hunting, you know, that's, that's what it's all about, yep. and that's that that culture and that lifestyle we like to support. And it's different in every state, and and in these cultures and these these generational things we pass down. That's what makes us, that's what makes the outdoors and everything so great. Very that's cool. interesting. I've, I've never experienced a uh, white tail hunt with dogs. That's kind of sparked my interest a little bit. Well, I tell you, you, go home with me, and you'll be amazed. My, my cousins, you know, they they're as redneck as they get, and uh, you never know what's going to be running. You might have a lab out there, you might have a half Doberman Pinscher German Shepherd, <laughs> and you might have a little ch- Chihuahua Feist. Yes, really. But in the end, anything will run a deer if you put really? them out there. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah, it, 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 it's it's uh, it could be a, t- a reality TV show probably. Yeah, I'm interested in this, Jay. I'm going to touch a little bit more. So you just, you just haul them out. We're we're getting Kyle Weaver side of whitetail hunting in Virginia with dogs. I think that was an invitation. I do believe. Yeah, I, I think it was absolutely. And, but it sparks my interest. It, it, pretty much, you just haul them out in a different other dogs. You got a truck box and go to the woods, uh-huh. and dump the dogs out, and uh, just pretty much take off like you're going on a coon hunt, but for whitetails. Is that yep. the way I'm seeing it. Yeah, I mean, you, that's it. Usually, two or three. You know, way we this is the way we did it was you know it was always those young kids that had we went with the, the dogs and you would you would position your people on the other ends and everybody knew where they were in the stands of, of a lot of woods or part of it. You know. You, you would section off and try to push a certain way, and over time you learn what the deer do, and and uh, you you try not to hunt the same areas over and over and over. We, you know we had lucky enough lands to hunt and move around a lot of public land to hunt, and you get the dogs with you, and you kind of yip them through, and eventually a deer jumps, and off they go together, mm-hmm. and eventually those deer usually will pass as we spread guys out, and we were only shotgun hunting, right. that's all we allowed in the county I grew up in, and. You know, it, the deer come by, they come by you about 45 miles an hour, you better be a good shot. <laughs> and if you get lucky, you get one. And if you don't, once it's over, 
you kind of meet it, you know, maybe it was a half mile, maybe it was a mile hike through, whatever, usually right. not that far, usually more than a half mile, and you gather back up, you pick a new push, and you do it again. Mm-hmm. And, really? uh, are, are they barking like ra- ra- rabbit dogs? Oh, yeah, just like guys? a rabbit dog run, no. absolutely. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm getting jazzed yeah. up about this. Oh, I don't like this yeah. And I'm telling you, I've seen all kinds of things run a deer. My grandpa used to always say, anything will run a deer. It takes a, we were rabbit hunters, so he would always, you know, he wasn't a big deer hunter. We grew up raising rabbit dogs. He would say, it takes a real dog, because he was a beagle guy. Takes a real dog to run a rabbit. You can teach anything to run a deer was kind of his say. <laughs> really, that, that's awesome. You know, I can hear the excitement in your voice. Huh? We like to hear that. Yeah, it was, it was fun. I mean, you know, that's what we did on Saturday. My cousins and all of us got together, and, and if you know, a lot some maybe one Saturday we rabbit hunted, and, and another another one we made deer hunt. You know, when we grew up, rabbit season came in, and I think you know early October, some all of October we rabbit hunt real hard into that mid-November, and then once deer season came in, rabbit hunting was really hard because there were so many people running dogs deer hunting. Yeah. No, so good. you jump in and deer hunt, and when deer season's over, you jump back in rabbit hunting in the deer, and that, that's just that's the way yeah. I grew up doing it. I right. love, It was quite you, a rush. It sounds like an awesome rush, you know. It's almost like you, you can have a rabbit dog, but train to, to run deer also. Yep. When I, yeah, you know, that was always any old rabbit hunter to tell you that was a hard part is teaching your rabbit dogs to run only deer, only rabbits to not deer. Right. right. And yeah, you know, we did some field trial and stuff. And, and when you got good ones, they would only run a rabbit. Deer could jump up in front of them and they'd watch him run off. They'd only run that rabbit. And that was, you knew you had something special then. Yeah. I've been behind some field trial rabbit dogs and stuff. Man, it's phenomenal what they, uh, what they don't break free for. They see a deer or anything and they just, they, they keep focused on the rabbits. But you know, I, Jay, I think that's, uh, uh, awesome podcast to have Kyle's cousin on for talking about white dogs with rabbit with a dog hunting deer well, with dogs. all your listeners that that time are below the Mason Dixon line. Otherwise, I'll never understand a word he says. No, yeah, that's, that's true. Right, there. <laughs> right. But when I did it, we had to, we had a group of about four or five beagles, and they were very very small dogs. You can hear them yipping coming through the the, the forest, um, and they'd have these little bells, so you could hear if the, you could hear the bell, you knew the do- dogs were close, so you better get ready. Really? Um, and it was always, it was shotgun only. And I, I always, for whatever reason, the smallest dog, uh, her name was Peanut, and she she would always come out last. And for whatever reason, Peanut and I had this bond, and she'd always show up <laughs> where I was standing and uh, never actually had a shot at a deer on any of the drives. Yeah, it, it, it's not easy. I mean, we've all seen what deer can do. Um, you get a deer, doe, buck, doesn't matter, coming by you, wide open, running, jumping, moving. It, it, it's, uh, you know, I was always taught to put it on the very tip of his nose and pull the trigger. Right, <laughs> and right. that was about the lead you had to take. Yeah. It, they, and, uh, sometimes it works and sometimes <laughs> it didn't. <laughs> I may need to take up some training that you guys offer to get get to yeah. jump on them. Here. Yeah, we'd have to have a whole new class on how to you know do that. Yeah. Probably, but, but like right, you say, everybody yeah, thinks but... it's this 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 you know negative slaughtering of deer. It's a whole lot harder to hit them running like that when they're walking up real close to you under a tree stand, and uh, it's challenging and it, it, it's fun in its own. It is. Um, and the theory I was taught, whether it's wrong or right, just what I was taught, is that the small dogs don't run as hard, they don't push the deer as hard. You get the big walkers, and they can run them, but they also run them. And they come by you, they're going a whole lot faster. That's right. And, uh, you know, it's a whole different style of hunting, the things you learn. And, and uh, I, you know, sometimes I enjoy going back, and I'll go out with them and not even take a gun. I'll just I'll just drive. I just enjoy that and watch mm-hmm. everybody else do it. Yeah, it is. Yeah, a, it sounds like a blast. It, it really is a blast, does. Dusty. You have to try it sometime. I'm, I'm, I'm all in. I really Yeah, am. we'll do it one of these days. Cool. I'm, I'm in, Kyle. I'm going to take you up on it. We're going to maybe we get Jay come down with us and. We, we go do this because it sounds like it, it's a it's a party in its own. It is. It, it kind of ends up not really being about the hunting. It, the process itself is just fun. Yeah, it's well, a different I, I just, process. I just want I want I really want to record the stories after these herd of deer ran by forty five <laughs> miles an hour and what happened. Well, it, you know, it's the same old thing. You know, when you miss, they cut your shirt sleeve, your shirt tail <laughs> off, and all that stuff. It, it, it all still happens. <laughs> oh, that's awesome, man. That, that's a great story in its own. <laughs> Um, Kyle, where does the NRA stand on the Bundy Ranch? You know, we really haven't had a stance on it. Um, it's, but I think it it speaks volumes of when people want to know where are where are where are people in this country right now, and what's going on. And people are a little bit fed up. You know, I, I think that's yeah. what it shows more than anything. And and this is just one of those situations where a group of people got together and said, "We've had enough. We we don't agree with what's going on." 
and we really haven't, you know, taken a position on it. Um, and it's not, you know, it has, it's not really something that's going after our, we're a single issue organization of, of Second Amendment rights. Right. But, uh, you know, the rights that we're fighting for are what are going to help all of our freedoms stay in place. Absolutely. All right. So if, if, uh, people are listening to the show, how do they get a hold of somebody at the NRA to renew their membership or get a new membership? Well, the easiest, easiest way to do it for most people nowadays is just go to www.nra.org and you can join right there. Or if not there, you can walk into just about any local gun store and there, they are almost, we have over uh, 10,000, I believe, NRA recruiters. More than that, I think it's 30,000 NRA recruiters in the country. You can walk in just about any gun store and say, I want to join the NRA and they'll hand you an application. You can join right there on the spot. That's cool. So there's nra.org, which is a membership um, division of the NRA. Um, what is NRA ILA? What's that all about? NRA ILA stands for National Rifle Association Institute for Legislative Action. Mm-hmm. And, uh, they, that was an entity we started back, you know, when we got into heavy into the, these politics and having to fight. We started this separate entity of, of a legislative lobbying arm that went in and fought for rights. And it's a part of the NRA, but that's really the part that Chris Cox runs and they run on a federal level, a state level and a local level of everything we're talking about, every kind of gun right, every kind of hunting bill, every kind of uh, access, right to hunt, all that stuff, up to, you know, putting out our endorsements and telling you how who's voting, how they vote on gun rights um, in the Senate and Congress, state level, local level, doesn't matter. And it's, you know, it, it, it's kind of because of how the last 20 plus years have been, it's been a huge focus that people see of NRA. And uh, we continue to be the most powerful lobbying group in the country. But that has nothing to do with Chris or any of his staff or any of that. That has to do with the members and the people. Right. You know, we, we have 5 million members. But the last poll we took of people exiting a, uh, from a voting, people, over 40 million people claim to be members of the NRA. That's where the power is because what it tells you is that right. 40 million people voted a certain way. That's some power. That's some big and power. And that's what the power is in the people. And that's Absolutely. what it's all about. And we're, that's, we're just, uh, that's what we're it's just about to be. To be the one in front of it. That's American. That's what it's all about. Um, it is. NRA news. That's Cam and Company and news about all things guns and the NRA, um, I would assume. Um, what's the NRA life of duty? NRA life of duty is, is a brainchild, really, of Wayne LaPierre's. You know, Wayne is, is uh, my hero. I tell you, he, the things he's done for the NRA and for this, this country is amazing. He's given himself to it. But all his travels and everywhere he goes, the one thing he kept coming back with is, you know, we need to do more for military, for law enforcement, and our first responders, especially coming out of, you know, 9-11 and all that. And uh, we we finally came up with this idea of a life of duty membership. And what it is, it's a membership directly designed. All the content from the Warrior magazine and all the life of duty online stuff is directed at the military and the law enforcement and our first responders. Mm-hmm. And um, it's done pretty well. It's got you know we we've got it out there. There's a lot of great stuff on if you go on the uh, life of duty TV and and check out the stuff there. there. Um, but we're getting ready to revamp it, turn it into a little bit of a different type of membership where it has a little better content and make it a little more like a normal membership for people, not a separated piece and, and just kind of improve and enhance that situation. And, you know, we want to be, we got all these great heroes out here fighting for our country every day. And in my mind, they're very underappreciated and NRA wants to be a home for them as well. You know, a lot of, it, it, it just drives me crazy when you see people just just not even acknowledge what these these great warriors and heroes do for us right. and and almost turn their back to them and, and that's the other part of it. it's meant to be NRA wants to be a home that they can come to right right I mean you talk about the NRA fighting for gun rights um, you've got the people who are coming back from overseas fighting for our entire way of life which includes gun rights but without them none of this exists exactly I mean the, the old saying freedom ain't free is live every day. You fight for it every day. Absolutely. There's always someone trying to take it. Yep. And, uh, you know, people, it, 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 and NRA, I think, has always been a leading organization when it comes to military and, and all that. And just, you know, today's culture is just so different that a lot of people don't even agree or dislike someone who serves in the military. And um, it's sad. And, and we right. want to continue to hopefully be a home for these people. That's great. NRA yeah. women, we talked about that a little bit, uh, opening up the largest growing um, division of the NRA was NRA women, I believe you said. It is, yeah. We if out there on some of that same stuff. We have the NRA, NRA uh, women's leadership 
uh, form out there. And, and actually, you know, Wayne and I met the other day and talked about this as new stuff we're doing. We've, we're developing a lot of training aspects that are, that are specifically more, uh, uh, developed toward women. You train women a little bit different. They carry a gun a little bit different. They're in a little bit different situations sometimes with men. Mm-hmm. So there's a little tweak into that training to make it specific for them. Beyond that, women getting involved in hunting. We already have some women on target program is what we have. It's very, they're again tweaked to uh, just that little difference sometimes where women want to be trained or need training in a little additional training in a different way just based on because they're a woman. A lot of times it comes down to how they carry. Women usually carry guns totally different than the way men do. It's a very good uh, point, yeah. And and so it's it's just tweaked to be that. Some women want to be trained by a woman and some women want to be trained by a man. So um, we have all those aspects in there. And, and we're going to continue to do more just to show all these. This, and we have another program that, you know, again, another one most people don't know about. It's called the Women's Wilderness Escape. And we run it out of Raton, New Mexico at the NRA Whittington Center, which is our our uh, arm out there of, a, I think it's about 25,000 acres, the greatest facility shooting, uh, faci- a shooting facility in the country. Wow. And uh, we run this wilderness. We call it WWE, not wrestling, but that's what the initials are. <laughs> right, and yeah. um, it's it's a seven-day deal where women get to experience everything you can think of in the outdoors. They get to wow. shoot every type of gun. They get to learn camping, out, anything to do with outfitting, hiking, survival, you name it. And it's just a great program we're going to look to expand. So, it's kind of like we were talking about the hunters. It's a very tweaked thing for the women to get involved. Very cool. And the last thing I wanted to just cover real quick was the King of Freedom. What's that about? Ring of Freedom is our, uh, we have a, an arm of the NRA called the Office of Advancement. And uh, we're lucky enough to have a lot of people like Larry Potterfields and and, um, and, and industry, Smith & Wesson. I don't want to leave people out. Rue on down the line. Uh, the Brownells, Midway USA, all these different, Joe Gregory. There's some names you'll see. These these people have all kicked off what we call the Ring of Freedom. And what that is is it's uh, the highest end of Ring of Freedom is a million dollars cash to the organization. Bill Ruger was actually one of the first to ever give us a million dollar cash personally. Oh, wow. And they they get a gold jacket. And we're giving out a bunch of gold jackets in India again this year. Mm-hmm. And um, with that, there's different levels. And it goes all the way down to $1,000 a year to the NRA. So it's just a special donor recognition of Ring of Freedom that people that just go that extra mile to support the organization. And we do a lot of special events to bring them together to help further, you know, cultural, culturally, philanthropically do things for the org. They get involved into different of our committees and, and that kind of thing. And it's really in the last five or six years here grown to be a, a pretty big deal. And, you know, it's kind of that competitive thing. You put it out there and people will do it. Um, I believe last year we gave out eight or nine gold jackets, and I think they're giving out that many again this year with a total of 15 or more individuals with gold jackets now. Um, and some of them, like Larry Potterfield with Midway USA, is in the multi-millions of money given now. And uh, it, it's, a, it's a neat thing that we never had that uh, we generated that it's really starting to take off. That's that's a good place to. I mean, it's a very good thing to have to recognize those that are donating large sums of money to the cause. You know, and most of them get into it because uh, they come from a, a, like a lot of us. They they were lucky enough to earn that money and do that. Yep. They want to give back. You know, to to the everyday, to the kids, to the all the programs. They want to ensure these things are yep. there forever for all of us to take part in. And, mm-hmm. and they all have their niche of something they're really interested in, and that's what they give their money toward furthering. Yep. And if I had the money, I'd do the same thing. Absolutely. Uh, anything else you'd like to cover, Kyle? No, you know, that's 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 the bulk of what's going on now. You know, six Beautiful. months from now, we can hit it again and probably have a whole different group of stuff. So. <laughs> good point. Yes. <laughs> all kinds of new stuff coming up, and it sounds like you guys are um, constantly evolving and changing and growing new programs and things like that to, to cover different aspects. Yeah, it, you know, in, in, in six months now, we're going to have all these elections, and it's going to be interesting to see how yes. these how the environment changes and hopefully we, we gain some things back that, that allow us a little more breathing room, but, uh, the battle is never going to go away. Of course, anytime right. soon. Yep. Right. Well, cool. Kyle, we, we appreciate you joining us on the show and we'd love to see you again down at the great American outdoor show. I'm assuming the planning starts for that pretty soon. And, uh, yep. We, uh, we've uh, got everything going and set up and, uh, and again, we're already working on it, selling booths and all that kind of stuff. Excellent. And, and I believe the dates this year are in 2015. I remember right. I believe it's February 7th 
through um, February fifteenth. Excellent. We'll we'll see you in the fifteenth. We'll see you in the media room for sure. Um, That's right down there. And <laughs> absolutely. Uh, maybe before then, we at, if there's time, maybe we can uh, hook up for a, a little deer hunt, uh, dog push type uh, hunt down there in Virginia. Absolutely. Well, I know you guys have my cards because you you look at them every day. I hear. And, yeah, uh, right here. You yep, can always right. get in touch with me. And you know, Jay, that's the, we we truly I appreciate the time you guys are giving us in this form to get out and help us. You know, the, the, the number one initiative I have for the next couple of years here is how we can get in touch with hunters and 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 make a connection and get them better involved in what we do and and hopefully provide a better service for them. So. Uh, I'm very thankful and appreciative of the opportunity to, to reach out. Well, that's fantastic. We're here for you guys. So if, if you need anything, you need us to reach out to any of our community, we're, we're here for you. Thanks, guys. Truly appreciate it. Dusty, I think I am completely knowledge doubt about the yeah. NRA. You know, absolutely on the knowledge doubt. But then again, I'm completely confident with my membership with the NRA and what I've got going with them mm-hmm. being a member. I, I'm hundred percent for the NRA and what they got going on. This card that I'm holding right now with the envelope that I received not long after attending the great American outdoor show, um, but where you lent me the $20 to renew my membership, by the way, thank you for doing that. Yeah. You know, NRA membership, I'll lend anybody 20 bucks to take care of that. You might want to be a little careful about what you say on the podcast. Cause you might actually have to pay for some memberships. You know, Whatever. It's uh if I'm standing there and we're both renewing and you need to borrow twenty dollars for your membership. That's right. Absolutely. Right. And and that's exactly right. So I, I got my envelope in the mail and that envelope and that card that's in that envelope stands for so much more than just gun rights. Absolutely. We heard it, you know, as Kyle would say, directly from the horse's mouth. Right. And that's why we had Kyle on the show mm-hmm. and look for Kyle to be on the Big Buck Race or Big Buck podcast more often to discuss what the NRA has going on. And we want uh, you as our listeners, followers and friends to know what the NRA has got mm-hmm. going on. And, uh, you know, it's going to encourage you to get a membership if you don't already. And, uh, you know, as a hunter, the NRA plays a big role in you being able to be out there in the woods. Yep. Our Kyle Weaver, Rifle Kyle Weaver, was most informative, and we are so glad that he is our friend and part of our community and that they are focused on the hunter more so than they ever have been before. Yeah, for sure, you know, and Kyle, props to you for what you got going on for the hunters and the shooters out there, and, and that's the kind of people that's behind the NRA, and that, that's awesome. Yep, so if you're uh, if you're listening to the show, um, you can, and you're anywhere near Indianapolis, you can get down to the NRA if you're a member or a non-member, if you want to go down and get a membership. they got a great show going on down in Indy, um, April 25th through the 27th. Um, so if you, if you're listening to the show, you want to go down there, you didn't know about it, go check it out. It's going to be one heck of a good time. And, uh, definitely if you haven't been to the great American outdoor show before down in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, that's, that's the pinnacle, man, in my eyes, that's the yeah, best. That, that, that was a well-organized, well put together, professionally family oriented outdoor show that I've ever been to. Yep. I, I couldn't agree more. I was so impressed. It was so classy. So many people walk around. It's really hard to keep something that big with that many people as classy as they did and they pulled it off with only 15 members that's amazing that yeah Yeah. that that tells you that they got an awesome staff at the nra yeah they have it figured out and they have it down to a science so man oh man that was just great i just really thank you again to kyle weaver for joining us on the big buck registry and explaining all the things for you know dating back to the history of when the nra was formed to when the Antis showed up in 1968 to everything that and every program that's going on at the NRA right now. We're, we're so uh, honored to have you on the show, and hopefully he'll, he'll join us again. Yeah, absolutely. You know, Thanks, Kyle, and uh, we look forward to talking with you again about what the NRA has got going on. It's, uh, it's an awesome organization, and uh, definitely if you're not a member, check them out, get a membership, and enjoy it. Yep. And uh, here's that special 800 number, 1-800-672-3888. And you can call there and uh, sign up for membership or visit their website, um, www.nra.org. Dusty, I think that's a wrap, man. Awesome. You know, check the NRA out. I hope you enjoyed the show. And uh, if you want to hook up with me at Chubby Tines Outdoors, go to facebook.com forward slash Chubby Tines Outdoors and uh, submit a photo sheds harvest what what you got going on we'd like to talk with you jay how can i get with you at the big buck registry well i'd like to 
have you join me on uh, iTunes. If you're an Apple user, go over to iTunes and download the podcast, Big Buck. Just type in Big Buck in the search bar, and, and then you can go and simply uh, listen to all the shows we've ever done. And if you wouldn't mind, just give us a review and give us a five star right there. We'd love to hear what you have to say about the show. Um, you know, and I guess you can give us a four star if you had to, but we like those five stars. Um, if you'd like to shoot me an email, send me an email to j at bigbuckregistry.com. Give us a call or send us a text of a big buck that you shot and we'll get it posted on our Facebook page, uh, 724-613-2825. And you can also uh, submit a buck on Facebook. Simply go to bigbuckregistry.com forward slash Facebook or Twitter, bigbuckregistry.com forward slash Twitter. Um, I think that's everything. Did I cover it all? I think so. Yeah, absolutely. All right, man. Good deal. I'm Jay Scott. And I'm Dusty Phillips. And this is the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Podcast. See you next week. Can't wait. Can't wait.